Shame 
Hey, good morning. Uh, I pray that you are blessed on this resurrection day. Um, why don't we take a minute and, and just open our time together in a word of prayer uh, to, to just ask and invite God, even though we're meeting like we've never met before. Um, you know, the church right now would be full of people and there would be a buzz and an excitement, but yet we don't have that today. We're scattered. So let's take a minute and by the power of the Spirit, ask God to bring us together as the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we want to praise you. We want to thank you uh, for this day. We praise you that your son was resurrected from the dead by your power, by his power. We pray, Father God, that you'd bless us with your presence. Father, we're in unprecedented times. We are not allowed to gather together, not because our government is oppressing us, but because we are inflicted with a virus that is um, ravaging our, our world. So, Father, I pray for the church, not only the bridge, and, but, Father, for the church universal that is scattered this morning. I pray that by the power of your Spirit, that we would be united through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. That what we experience today, Father, would be just as meaningful as it is when we gather together to celebrate the resurrection of the King. Father, I pray that you would quiet my heart, that you'd give me the words to speak, and that your Spirit would lead me. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a quick journey, a journey uh, the last week of Christ through the resurrection and, you know, last Sunday um, we talked about the, uh, the triumphal entry. And Jesus is going to enter into Jerusalem. And, and he's marching directly towards the cross, his execution. He's going to give himself away for our sins. He's going to die an innocent man for a wretched sinner like me. And, you know, as they near the village of Bethany, he sends two of his disciples ahead of them to, to find a donkey in, in his colt, and they're to bring the, the, uh, the donkey and the colt to Jesus. And as Jesus told them what would take place, they found it exactly that same way, and they brought the colt to Jesus. And Jesus sits upon that donkey's colt. He sits there and enters into Jerusalem humbly. He makes his triumphal entry. He's, he's fulfilling the ancient uh, prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, where it says, Rejoice, O daughters of Zion. Shout, daughters of Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You know, the crowds were, were gathered around him at that time, and they were waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know, Jesus' triumphal entry, it, they were looking for a conquering king, but he wasn't coming as a conquering king. In fact, he was coming as a humble servant, one who would give his life away. On Monday morning, instead of entering into the, uh, the, the throne room there of the king, he enters into the temple. Instead of you know, running the Romans out, he runs the money changers out. He comes in and he finds that the temple of God has been turned into a robber's den. He finds that the court is filled with money changers and it's crowded and, and that outer court was designed for, for the nations, all people to be able to come in, Jews and non-Jews, especially the non-Jew to come in and to be able to, to, to look and explore and understand the worship of God. And he begins to overturn the tables. And shouting and saying, the scriptures declare that my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into the den of thieves. And he cleanses the temple, and he teaches, and he heals. And he further infuriates the religious leaders at that time. And the plot for his death begins to truly take shape. 
I'm going to jump a little bit ahead to Thursday because it paints such an intimate scene. It's the time for the Passover and the Last Supper. Jesus and his disciples have been staying in Bethany. And Jesus sends Peter and John ahead to an upper room in Jerusalem to make the preparations for the Passover. That evening after sunset, Jesus washed his disciples' feet as he prepared to share the Passover with them. You know, by performing this humble act, taking on the form of the lowest servant in the house, Jesus teaches us something so important and leaves us an example of how we should love one another. In John chapter 13, Jesus speaking, he says, Since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Think about that. Jesus himself washes the feet. He washes the feet of all of the disciples. Even though he knows that Judas is going to betray him. Even though he knows that he soon will go to the cross because of what Judas does. He still humbles himself and washes his Judas' feet. Then Jesus shares the Passover meal with them, with his disciples. He tells them, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until, it is, until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. You see, as the Lamb of God, Jesus was about to fulfill the meaning of the Passover, the deeper meaning, by giving his body to be broken and his blood to be shed, a sacrifice that would free us from our sin and ultimately free us from death. You see, during this Last Supper, Jesus establishes the Lord's Supper, communion as we call it. And he instructs his followers that we are to continually do this as we come together by sharing the elements of the bread and the wine. You see, he took some bread and he gave, in Luke chapter 22, it says he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same, after supper, he he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice to you. You know, Jesus tells them that one of them sitting at that table would betray him. That they would betray him that night. He says, the one who dips in the cup with me. And they all ask, who is it? Who is it? And Peter makes this great proclamation. He says, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. But Jesus replied, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow, you will deny me three times. Three times that you even know me. And he looks at Judas and says, go. Go and do what you must do. And Judas leaves the room. All the other disciples agreed with Peter that they wouldn't leave Jesus, that they wouldn't deny him. But yet, at the crucifixion, there's only John to be found. You know, it tells us that later on, Jesus and his disciples left the upper room And they went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed in agony. He's he's so in anguish. He brings his disciples there and and he, he brings Peter, James, and John along with him. And as they come to that to that that familiar place, it says that Jesus goes a stone throw away. And he begins to cry out, Father. If you're willing, please take this cup from me, this cup of suffering. 
Yet, not my will be done, but yours, Father. The Bible tells us that an angel came and appeared and, and strengthened him. And he prayed even more fervently. And he was in such agony of spirit and, and feeling the crushing mo of the, the crush of the moment that he's in, knowing what's about to come. He begins to sweat great drops of blood. At least his disciples would be there. But he comes and he finds them asleep. They're asleep, and he asks them, can't you even pray with me for an hour? The Bible says he goes away and prays again. He prays again with great anguish. and says, Father, is there any way that this cannot happen? Is there any way? We see his humanity as he looks at the cross and the suffering that would be there. As he, in that moment, he comes back and he finds them still asleep. And he wakes them up again and says, look, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. And at that moment, Judas comes with the temple guard and, and some soldiers with him. He'd given them a signal. He says, the man that I kiss, he's the one. And at that moment, Jesus looks at Judas and says, Judas, are you going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And Peter kisses Jesus on the cheek. And the guard sees him, and Peter draws his sword and, and, and cuts the ear off of one of the men standing there. See, Peter proved that he was willing to die. He was willing to start the revolution that they so thought was going to come. And Jesus tells Peter, put your sword away. And he heals that man. He touches his, his ear and puts it back in place. And yet, Jesus was taken to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the whole council, all of the religious leaders were gathered. And they began making false accusations. They began to accuse him of causing uh, of blasphemy. They accuse him of everything. And none of, none of it lines up. None of it lines up. Finally, someone stands and said, he said that he will tear this temple down that was built with human hands and he will raise it up, build it back in three days. And the high priest tears his garment and they take Judas off to Pilate. Because see, they couldn't sentence him to death. They couldn't sentence him to death. And he's examined by Pilate, and, and as Pilate examines him, he comes out and says, I find nothing, nothing wrong. This man has done nothing wrong. And they began to insist even more and even more. And, and Pilate, fearing that there was going to be a, a riot, gives in to their request. And he brings Jesus out before the crowds. Because, see, it was his custom to release a prisoner on that day. Pilate thought, I'll, I'll put him before the people. The people love him. And they said, what would you have me do with this man? And they yelled, crucify him. Crucify him. They took Jesus in. And they led him away and the soldiers stripped him naked. And they began to beat him and torture him and mock him. The Bible says that he was beaten beyond recognition. And they placed a crown of thorns upon his head. They beat him for me. They beat him for you. They placed a purple robe upon him.
Then Jesus carried his whole cross to Calvary. He was mocked and insulted along the road. The Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross. They placed nails in his hands and his feet. And they stood him up. They stood him up between two criminals. Matthew gives us a record of it. It says at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama nai sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, at that moment, our sin with Jesus' arms stretched wide, our sin was placed upon him. He was hung there as an innocent man, it was hung there because of me, because of you. Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elisha. One of them ran and filled the sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed and a stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see if whether Elisha comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted again and released his spirit. You see, it was about 3 p.m. when that took place. The Bible tells us that the Jews didn't want to wait and for, for them to die naturally, so the Jews asked that the legs be broken. And they broke the legs on the man on the right and the legs on the man on the left. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. Yet the soldier took his spear and he thrust it into his side. And blood and water poured forth. Blood and water. See, Christ didn't die of crucifixion. Jesus died of a broken heart. When our sin was placed upon him and his father could no longer look upon the sin, Christ's heart broke for you and for me. Then about 6 p.m. on Friday, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body down from the cross. And they laid it in the tomb. In John 19, it records, Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jew, Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, a man who had come to Jesus at night. They brought about seven pounds of perfume ointment made from myrrh and aloe. Following Jewish burial custom, following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with spices in a long sheet of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a tomb never used before. And so because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. You see, Satan thinks he's won. The Jewish leaders think they've won. The Roman government thinks they have won. But then comes Sunday. Then comes the greatest day that has ever been recorded. Then comes the day of resurrection when the King of kings and the Lord of lords was raised from the dead by his own power. Matthew records it this way. It says, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning. His clothes, clothing was, like, was, was as white as snow. 
And the guard shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. The angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're here looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead, just as he said. Come and see where they have laid his body. And now go quickly and tell his disciples, he is, he is risen from the dead. He is gone. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember that I, what I have told you. The woman ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed into the disciples with the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran into him. And they ran into his grasp and grasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave Galilee. To leave for Galilee and they will see me there. You know, as we think about that, that what a great day. He is risen from the dead. You know, on the day of resurrection, Jesus made... Uh, Everything that he said validated. He made at least five appearances on that first day. Mark's gospel says the first person to see him was Mary Magdalene. Jesus also appeared to Peter, to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And later that day, all the disciples except for Thomas, while they were gathered into an upper room, while they were there for prayer and, and still doubting what had taken place. You see, these eyewitnesses' accounts in the gospel prove that what we believe cannot be denied. That the resurrection of Christ truly happened and truly took place. But you ask, why, why did all that have to take place? Why? I can tell you why. For God so loved the world. He loved you and me enough to send His only begotten Son to die on Calvary's cross that we would have forgiveness of our sins. That He would be resurrected. You see, the prophet gave us, told us of this event hundreds of years before. In Isaiah chapter 53, it, it paints the picture of what has just taken place. It says, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed His powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about His appearance, nothing to attract us to, to Him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with deepest grief. Our, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were punishment from God, a punishment of his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. For our transgressions, he was crushed because of our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to slaughter and like a sheep is silent before his shears. He did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebel rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. 
Yet when his life is made an offering for our sins, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Then he sees all he has accomplished by his anguish. He will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. So why did this all take place? It took place because of our past. Our past. You see, each and every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. The scripture tells us that our sin separates us from God because He is holy and we are not. We have fallen short of His glory, Romans 3.23. We can't measure up to His standard. We cannot get to heaven on our own perfection. The Bible tells us our perfection is like filthy rags. But God devised a plan of redemption. He would send His only Son, Jesus Christ, to this world to live a perfect life. And He would ultimately go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sin. We know the scripture. Even if you've never read the Bible, you've heard, for God so loved the world, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. You see, what does this mean? Someone may wonder, how could a man do that? How could an ordinary man do that? He was no ordinary man. But he was God himself. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He came and lived with us. He was God in the flesh. And through him, because he was sinless, because he lived a life in total communion with God, through his sacrifice, we can be justified. He pays the price for our sin. See, you can choose to pay the price for your sin. You'll pay for that price in a place called hell. Or you can receive the free gift of God through Jesus Christ. And He will pay the price or has paid the price for your sin. You see, Jesus Christ said Himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come through the Father except through me. You see, only by placing our trust in Him for the forgiveness of our sins and following Him, just not having a moment at an altar or taking time to pray where you are. But following Him as a disciple, becoming like Him, one who is trained like Him. And we have a place in heaven. And because Jesus Christ came back from the grave, it's demonstrating the reality of His words and the truth of His statements. We know that His statements are true. You see, He takes care of our past. He paid the price for our sin. But not only then, he is, it's because of the here and now. You know, most people are surprised to know that the resurrection has everything to do with the time and the moment that we live. It has to do everything to do with our present. The Bible tells us that because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the grave, that He gives us that same power, that we can be like Him. We can grow and become sanctified, that we can become like Him through the power of the resurrection. That same power that brought Jesus Christ back from the dead. You see, over and over again, we read that Jesus, that Jesus has given us the power to live a life that would please God. He promised that at the moment of our salvation to give us the Holy Spirit, that He would teach us and lead us into all truth. You see, I love Ephesians chapter 1. 
19 and 20, where, where Paul, speaking to the church, says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in a place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. What does this really mean for us? Listen, it means that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that God gives me to lead a life that would please Him. You see, if we depend on our own power to try and live a life that will please God, it will end in destruction. It'll end in destruction. Listen, we're sinful, but He still loves us. In fact, He saved us from our sin through the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus. He changes us from, from being cruel and mean-spirited and hateful people. And we discover that we can have a desire to be kind and loving and gracious. Listen, he changes us from being lustful and immoral. And he takes those emotions and those desires and changes them by the power of God that we have used them to love others. We can become a different people. We can become like Christ himself. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. How does it happen? It happens because God loves us enough that he gave his only begotten son. Because, see, the almighty God comes to live within us and fills us with the power of the resurrection. But see, it also has a future plan to it, the resurrection. Thirdly, not only does God's res resurrection affect our past and our present, but it guarantees our future. Because Jesus rose from the grave, he, be he, became he, he becomes for us believers a guarantee. One day that if we should die before he comes back, or that we are raptured out of this world, that we would not remain in the grave but that we would have heaven as our home. See, Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says, For since we believe that Jesus died and was risen again, we also believe that Jesus, when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him believers who have died. We tell you this directly from, from the Lord, who are... We who are still living when the Lord returns will not, meet, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a command, with a shout from the voice of, of, an angel, of the archangel. And with the trumpet of God, the first, first the Christians who have died will be raised from the graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will ever be with the Lord. You know, what does all this mean? It means that we have a guarantee as believers that we will be raised from the dead or caught up in the air to be with Christ forever. Listen, if Christ hadn't come out of the grave, we would have no hope. We'd have no hope because we would die without knowing God and having our sins forgiven. We'd live in despair. The question that we must ask, have you placed your trust and your hope in Christ alone? Have you asked Him to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins? And have you committed your life to follow Him? That you would become like Him that you'd receive the gift of eternal life. You see, for the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, as Christians, we no longer have to fear death because we have an incredible hope. Not a hope that I hope so, a hope that I know so, that death cannot hold me down that my sins have been forgiven, and that I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let me ask, 
Have you ever committed your life to Christ? You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is simply this. The gospel is this, that the kingdom of God has come through Jesus Christ. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the King, God's one and only Son. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and was resurrected on the third day according to the Scriptures. In His great love and by His amazing grace, God our Father saves everyone. He saves everyone who repents of their sins and believes the gospel and follows Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when He returns on the last day, the great day of judgment, everyone who has followed Him will enter in to the eternal kingdom of God. Would you like to receive Christ as your Savior? I want to encourage you to take time and just go before God and confess your sin. Ask Him to forgive you, to fill you with His Holy Spirit, and commit your life to follow Him. If you're doing that today, I want you to take the time and message us here at the church. Write us a private message so that we can follow up with you and begin to disciple you and help you grow and become who God has called you to be. May God bless you. And I look forward to the day that we can gather together as the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I praise you and I thank you. I thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And I pray, Father God, that by the power of your Spirit, that anyone who is listening today that doesn't know Christ will commit their life to follow Christ. Father, I pray that by the power of your Spirit that you touch those lives. For I ask this, for the sake of the kingdom of Jesus, your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. If you've committed your life to Christ today, please contact us. Write a short email. Go to our website at thebridgemt.com. There's a place there that you can message us. May God bless you. Thank you for joining. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I Give me Jesus.
forgive me, Jesus. Give me Give me.